The project I'm about to illustrate is potentially a groundbreaking model for the repair of the urban and suburban blight, which is sadly widespread worldwide. The location of this project is in northern Italy, specifically the town of Rozzano uh, on the south edge of Milan in the Po Valley, northern Italy. As you may be able to tell from this, this map, the north of Milan is highly industrialized because the land was not very fertile. So in the 19th century, the population turned to alternative means of sustenance. The south of Milan is very green because it is very, very fertile land. Rozzano is unusual in that it is built in this agricultural green belt around the south of Milan. And it's adjacent to the peripheral highway, which runs in a circular fashion around the entire city. Up to 100 years ago, it was little more than a small agricultural village with farm workers' houses and large-scale farms dotted around the countryside. Now it is a town of 44,000 inhabitants, uh, not uh, having a very identifiable town center. It's widespread and low density. It has a lot of industrial activity to the east. Um, it is flanked on the west by the canal which runs out of Milan to the south to Pavia, which creates that hard edge along the west. Uh, as you can also see, it, it does contain a lot of green space, which is the one asset the town maintains. The project is actually two sites, which are hi highlighted in red here, one to the south near the canal and one to the north adjacent to the highway that runs around the south of Milan. Rozzano was developed in the 60s and 70s to house immigrants from the south of Italy who were looking for jobs in Milan. In 10 years, it grew from 2,700 to almost 33,000 inhabitants. 27,000 of these were located in social housing. The model that they used for the development of the city was Soviet suburban uh, dormitory town. So high-rise housing blocks built of prefabricated modular reinforced concrete panels. Widely spaced with green space between them, low-rise residential areas, I'm um, sorry, low-rise um, retail areas and high-rise res residential. Not an appealing environment for the human to inhabit. Uh, some of these are Soviet pictures, some of these are Rozzano. Um, this is Rozzano. There's not a big difference between the two. This is actually a postcard from the 1970s with a school in the foreground. This is an aerial view with the peripheral highway on the right-hand side. The buildings were of very poor construction. Uh, people did not want to live in them. Um, so even from the start, the people that did live and do live in Rozzano are those that don't have a choice. Um, so the architectural and urban choices that Rozzano made in the, that period resulted in great social disadvantage. The town council now realizes that these buildings have reached the end of their lifespan, being reinforced concrete, and don't want to restore or repair them. They want to replace them gradually with humane urbanism. Um, so they approached the office of Pier Carlo Bontempi, and I was entrusted with this job, uh, as I've lived in, and worked in the area myself, as well as working together with Pier Carlo Bontempi. Um, I have lived and worked in this area for uh, decades and know the um, environment very well. This is the center of the city, the main street. Here are some shops along that same street, very low quality, low rise retail buildings. More shops in the city center, um, not a great choice for the inhabitants. There was also some what they call neighborhood retail um, built in between the large housing blocks. This was, for obvious reasons, not successful and has lie, laid unused and abandoned for decades. This is where the people of Rotsana prefer to do their shopping. They go to the neighboring town where there's a huge mall on the American uh, model with a large parking lot, multi-screen cinema, um, office buildings, houses. Um, this, unfortunately, as we know, is the model uh, for the modern city centre today. The two sites that I was entrusted with are old sports fields. 
Um, the town has created new sports facilities um, in different locations. This is the site to the north, um, adjacent to the peripheral highway, separated from the highway by an expanse of green parkland. Um, there is a castle you can see in the top left of the picture, which is a historic farm, uh, one of the historic farms around the area. <coughs> this is the southmost uh, site. Um, the north of this site, again, sports fields, is flanked by these two little rivers, two brooks, uh, and green park, parkland area. It's, adjacent, it's close to the canal. On the left, you can see the canal from Milan to Bavia running north-south. Um, the town specifically asked that I develop projects that were walkable and uh, used the principles of new urbanism. These projects were to be, were, are to be uh, models for the future and subsequent development of the rest of the town as the, the social housing blocks are gradually removed. These are pictures of the sites. This is the north site seen from the green area to the north of it. This is the road flanking the north site, which is a dead end road. This is the south site, sports fields, flanked by roads on the, on the south, east and west sides. As I initiated this project during lockdown due to COVID, I had to use a lot of online resources. Um, so I gathered GIS data from regional uh, geoportal for each site, north site, south site, and I distilled this into base maps of essential information, dark green being public greenery, public parklands, light green being private uh, greenery, black obviously buildings, grey roads, beige, other paved areas on the south side. Then to understand the scale of these sites, which are both about the same size, they're both about 10 acres in size, um, I drew up a, a line around the perimeter of the north site and overlaid it on towns that are familiar to all of us, such as Pienza, and Sabioneta. Um, these, are, as you know, are both uh, designed and planned towns. I also looked at um, more local towns. This is the town of Gaggiano, which is along the Naviglio Grande, which is a, a canal running out of Milan to the west. Um, Gaggiano is a very picturesque little rural town, uh, a good model for the type of environment I'm trying to create for Rozzano. <clears throat> Another um, good traditional town in the area is Abbiata Grasso, which is a bit further to the west, a Roman town with a castle, small castrum, and winding streets with porticos. Um, all of these towns so far I would, I would classify as street-based uh, urbanism. So although they have Pienza and Savineta do have some piazzas uh, in the center, the, the greater part of the fabric of these cities is street-based um, rather than space-based. So I looked also to the um, market towns of Padua. The center of Padua is very much oriented around spaces on a sort of checkerbook uh, um, pattern with open space interspersed with buildings and blocks. You have the, the two market squares either side of the Palazzo della Ragione, and you have the, the Piazza dei Signori uh, further to the west. This creates a very interesting and engaging sequence of spaces and buildings. Um, this is also the case of Mantua, which is another market town. Uh, sequence of space from the north, the Piazza dei Signori to the south, to the Church of Sant'Andrea. Um, the spaces within the Ducal Palace itself are also part of that urban sequence and part of the, the public space of the city. Here we have the parade ground to the right and the, the square of the chapel to the left. These are towns we use as models rather than street-based towns because the one um, 
asset that Roxana has is green space, as I mentioned. So I wanted to maintain that communication with the green space. So the my first studies for the urban layout of these neighborhoods was a similar kind of checkerboard plan um, with open space block, open space block in a sequence which invites people into the into the neighborhood and maintains communication with the greenery around it. Uh, here's a quick uh, roof study. I also did some landscape studies of the surrounding landscape to create vistas into the landscape and from the landscape into the neighborhood. A volumetric study to verify the scale of the neighborhood itself. The south neighborhood is a more explicit uh, checkerboard plan with block space, block space in alternate, alternating patterns going from more ceremonial public space on the roadside towards more private and intimate space towards the, the surrounding parkland. Again, a study for roof plan and a volumetric study. So as well as creating an urban environment that could relate to the greenery around Rotsano and not create very, very high dense neo-medieval borgo, which would be very unfitting in the existing um, environment of Rotsano, the other challenge was to create an architectural character for these new neighborhoods, um, create an identity uh, for a, a new a transformed Rotsano. The town, unfortunately, does not have a lot of architectural material of historic um, character because it was a very small rural hamlet. One of the few buildings is the castle, which is, a, which is actually an agricultural castle. Some of the agricultural buildings of that castle are now a public library. There are other farms in the area. Um, this is the Cascina Grande, which is near the historic hamlet of Rozzano. This is also a library. The historic hamlet itself has a few interesting buildings. You have the town hall on the right. The industrial buildings along the canal, which are old textile factories, are quite interesting as well. The workers' houses for those factories are amongst the more interesting buildings in Rozzano. And some of the farm workers' houses in Rozzano are also quite interesting. Um, this is really the extent of the, of the language of historic architecture in, in Rotsano. Uh, another farm close to Rotsano, just to the, to the west across the canal, is this Cascina Salterio. So to establish uh, an architectural character which could be appealing, uh, engaging, uh, uplifting, and also appropriate for today's uses, uh, that could uh, contain a memory of the place of, of northern Lombardy, I had to look further afield to places, to rural architecture and towns in other locations. This is Pieve del Cairo in the province of Pavia, to the south of Milan, a very picturesque but very sleepy rural town with what I would describe as naive classical architecture. Um, as you see, what is, what is happening here is people are taking elements of more monumental architecture to aspire to. Um, the people of northern Italy, even today, don't want to live in things that look like farm workers' houses. Farm workers' houses are very poor uh, and they evoke a history of hardship. They want to believe they're living in something greater. Um, and this is, a, I think, a characteristic of vernacular architecture everywhere. People take elements of more monumental buildings and put them in vernacular architecture um, to express their aspirations. This is again Pieve del Cairo, you know, some very elegant small palazzo buildings. This is a small manor house to the east of Milan in a, in a town called Gradella. <clears throat> so taking classical elements and using them in a rural um, environment to uplift and elevate the architecture just a little bit. This is to the north of Milan. And one of the, the, the most interesting types of architecture actually to look at is that of the farms in northern Italy, in Lombardy. Um, funnily enough, the, the agricultural architecture um, as being the source of wealth and the source of income 
is more elevated, almost always, always more monumental than the residential architecture. There's much more attention given and detail applied to agricultural buildings than there is to farm workers' cottages. Farm workers' cottages are very simple, paired, Spartan buildings. Barns, cow sheds, stables are much more monumental. And they provide a great wealth of, of architecture to aspire to. These are, town, these, are, these are farms in the surrounding countryside, close to Rotsana. This is along the, the Navillo Grande, um, leading out of Milan to the west again. So, I mean, you have, this is a barn, a, a farm, which is you know, clearly of classical der derivation using Roman, Roman motifs. This is a fortified farm to the south of Milan. It has two symmetrical gatehouses uh, with a moat in between them and it's built around a medieval church. It's a, the farms of northern Italy are small towns. Um, the, the first farms, of course, were monasteries. The first people to drain the swamp, which was northern Italy, the Po Valley, were Benedictine and Cistercian monks. And so these monasteries were uh, cloister-based, and so the farm itself took on the same, the same sort of form. So you have, you know, very monumental um, classical elements in Lombard farms. Even the pigsties look like churches with rose windows and bifurl windows. And there's quite a variety um, to, look, to look at. The agricultural architecture also has the advantage that it provides um, typologies and spaces which are richer than the most simple um, farm workers' cottages. Um, so you can address the needs of modern day uses, uses much more than you know, very simple um, vernacular uh, farm workers' houses could. These are some farms in the Royal Park of Monza. These are actually architect designed by Luigi Canonica in the, 19, in the 1700s. So you have you know, spared, pared down classical motifs being used in a rural agricultural environment. This is a collection of some of the farm buildings in the Royal Parks of Monza, um, from you know very picturesque to more utilitarian, but very interesting use of material and motifs. So very very rich um, palette to draw from, and it doesn't come as a surprise to me. I mean, it may be quite a shock to you, but the the, the first building that I can think of, the first secular building which has a pediment actually surmounting the facade is this, and this is a, uh, a farm built in the, in the 1530s by Giulio Romano for the Gonzagas, north of Mantua, of course. So the, um, the source of wealth, the source of income, was elevated almost to the, to the form of a temple. So these, this research um, inform the architectural design of these new neighborhoods. Um, here's the south site. Um, here are some, this is a very simple uh, verification of the number of, of living units on the site. And here are some sketches, initial sketches of the architectural character. So the piazza that opens to the road to the southwest is of a more monumental character. It invites you into the interior piazza with a palazzo which is canted to put, terminate the vista. Here is a secondary, another secondary piazza with a, a drinking fountain, you know, watering fountain for, for animals in the middle of it, uh, with two U-shaped buildings either side. Here is a more intimate space in the same neighborhood with a passageway which leads to the, the surrounding parkland. And this is the south um, neighborhood. The roof plan, a typical apartment uh, layout, not of the individual apartments, but of how the, the apartments are distributed in, within each building. Um, the buildings also have their own more private uh, green courtyards, which are in communication in many cases with the surrounding countryside. The, I, I modified the, the road layout in this case 
because the, the road to the south of the site was a dead end road and to avoid having a dead end um, which creates a sort of stagnant atmosphere I created a link around the neighbouring school, I couldn't go through the school but I went around it so create a connection with the rest of the town. There's also both of the sites have um, bicycle paths and footpaths in the in the um, surrounding parkland, which communicate direct with the, directly with the neighbourhood as well. The north for the north side, I, I did actually a full study of the, the layout of the parking garage. The parking garage underneath the the neighbourhood is private is for the private residents. There is you know also obligatory on street parking, unfortunately, around the site, which is you know, minimised as much as possible. Um, for the underground parking, it's not exactly underground. I, I exploited the change in level. The road, um, the public road, is actually higher than the countryside, and um, by raising, rising slightly from the road entrance in, into the interior of the neighbourhood, I was able to create that space necessary for the parking garages to be underneath the houses. This is an initial, initial sketch through the centre of the neighbourhood on the main axis. And the, um, the architecture of these neighbourhoods was, was defined in quite, quite a lot of detail. Um, the full architectural character of each of these neighbourhoods was, was fully, fully um, studied. These are two uh, sections along the main central axis of the north neighbourhood. The top, uh, the top section is from the countryside on the left to the town on the right. Uh, the bottom section is from the town on the left to the countryside on the, on the right. So the ground rises gradually and when it meets the countryside on the right, um, it creates a, a, a C-shaped public piazza which is slightly raised over the, uh, the surrounding countryside and creates a, a viewpoint. Um, this is, uh, these are two more street, this is a street section on the top and a side view of the, the entire neighbourhood seen from the southeast. So you can see that the, the parking garages are underneath the buildings and they, what look like uh, basement windows, are actually ventilation for those parking garages. And finally, this is an over, overview of the, the north east of the, of the northern um, neighbourhood seen from the surrounding green, green space. Um, as you go towards the countryside, towards the parkland, the character of the architecture becomes slightly more rural. Um, the, the courtyard to the right con connects and communicates directly with the parkland. So the next step for these projects is for them to be inserted into the development plan of the town. This will take uh, the best part of a year or more. And when that uh, process is completed, the two sites will be put to tender for private development. Um, the town does not have a, a chosen developer to develop either of these sites. Um, so I am actually in contact with private developers myself in the hope of creating a partnership um, whereby I can guarantee that the quality of the buildings that they will build will be the best possible for Rotsana. And the end result is that these two sites are to be pilot projects really for the future development of the rest of the city as the existing housing blocks and uh, uh, Soviet urbanism, let's say, are, are redu removed and replaced with new urbanism and humane, a humane city environment. Thank you very much.